So while sales for the Angel of Darkness were incredibly strong, it was still a gigantic flop because of the many, many faults it had, and at long last caused the Tomb Raider series to die, cancelling the other two planned games that were to follow it and form the trilogy. Core was no longer allowed to produce any more games for the franchise, and was then in the hands of Eidos Interactive. Surprisingly, they still wanted the Tomb Raider series to carry on, so they assigned the control of the games to another company called Crystal Dynamics, who would go on to make their own trilogy of games. So what exactly could this new company bring to the Tomb Raider series that we already haven't seen before? Could these be the people to fix all that was wrong in the past games? Well, let's find out by looking at the first of the, what I prefer to call, Crystal Dynamics Trilogy with Tomb Raider Legend. The story involves a young Lara and her mother taking a plane to somewhere rather, but shortly crashes into apparently the Himalayas, but I'm pretty sure the game doesn't say exactly where. Lara and her mother take shelter in, apparently, an ancient Buddhist monastery, but again, I don't think the game tells you that. Is it in the character profile somewhere? Because I'd like to know how this information is coming about. Anyway, Lara finds a sword and a stone. Yeah, I bet you know what's coming up later. And accidentally activates it. As her mother comes in and gets involved in a ye old Skype call, someone is requesting specifically for Lara. But her mother quickly pulls out the sword and vanishes along with the exploded stone die. Years later, when Lara is an adult, she searches for a similar stone die in a Bolivian tomb. With what in my opinion has got to be the best looking model for Lara Croft I've seen so far. Anyway, on her way to the stone die, she comes across another adventurer with an unsuitably swanky outfit named James Rutland, who happens to hold a fragment of the sword that made Lara's mother disappear. You'll also eventually come across her old friend Amanda, who's strangely voiced by the mothers from Coraline. But it seems that Amanda's turning against Lara because she believes that she didn't try to save her from a collapsing Peruvian tomb that they were investigating. Sound familiar? Before that though, it seems that there was also a shadowy figure killing the rest of the team that Lara and Amanda were with. In present times when Lara returns to the Peruvian tomb, she comes across one of the sword fragments and discovers that as well as being the key to activating the stone die in Bolivia, it's also, of course, Excalibur! So it's up to Lara to find the rest of the pieces before either Amanda or Rutland do. Goodbye, stiff controls, hello, fluidity. Lara handles a million times better than she did in the earlier games. No longer do you have to painstakingly line your jumps, worry about needless animations, and building up your strength. Lara can now move in any direction you tell her to, so that means no more jumping back and slowly rotating, and the animations are basic and rapid. In addition, Lara will automatically grab onto a ledge and is able to drop below with a simple press of a button. She's also now able to manually lock on enemies and easily change targets just by using the right analog stick. Now this is something I don't find terribly useful, but if you want to, you can manually aim your gunshots for more precision. The game also encourages you a lot more to use acrobatics for evading attacks, and let me tell you, it is incredibly satisfying dodging numerous bullets just by using a bunch of rolls and flips. A new ability to the series is the use of a grappling hook. This is mainly used for swinging across gaps, but it can also pull various objects towards you and help solve puzzles. Speaking of which, the puzzles are also a bit more diverse. While there are still some that require you to press a switch in a certain way, most of them are mainly physics based and you have to use them to your advantage, even on some of the boss fights, which is pretty sweet, and it's a nice way to show off the new engine. Basically everything in this game just feels faster, and it provides a much more soothing and incredibly fun experience to the likes of the PlayStation games and especially Angel of Darkness. This is exactly what the series needed. Simple evolution. I had no idea why Core struggled so much to do so. And Legend was made by a company who had never even worked on a Tomb Raider game before. But my god, did they do one hell of a job. You're also given a lot more information than any other Tomb Raider game has done so far, like the boss's health, a recap of the story so far, and of course the aforementioned character profiles to provide some background data. It's little things like that that make such a huge impact on the overall adventure. Lara is also a hell of a lot more likable than she was in Angel of Darkness. She does still act tough, but not overly so like she was in the PlayStation games, and she's also a lot friendlier than she was in Angel of Darkness. She basically acts more like a real woman this time around. Spunky, but fragile at the same time. She also has a couple of supporting characters with her called Zip and Alistair, who aren't quite as engaging as Lara, but they're still okay to have around. I very much like how positive and fascinated Lara is with her work, and this, along with her other mannerisms, creates some pretty awesome character development for her. Oh, by the way, she's now voiced by Keeley Hawes, who you'll probably only recognize as Alex Drake from the Ashes to Ashes series. And being Keeley Hawes, she tends to speak really, really quietly. And now we're going to have a useful conversation. It's turned out quite nicely. Okay, well in her defense, she does make a damn fine Lara, so let's move on. The only character I don't particularly like is Amanda. Well, yeah, I know I'm not supposed to like her, but I don't know, so I just find her pretty irritating. 
And it doesn't help that she has a whiny and nasally voice. Damn it, Laura, I'm busy. It's all about a broader perception. She went where I was supposed to go, where you could have gone! Yeah, yeah, yeah! Finally, for those of you who missed being able to explore Lara's mansion in the last three games, Croft Manor makes a hell of an upgraded return. As well as being able to show you the ropes before moving on to the real thing, it's also more or less its own mini-game. You now actually have stuff to do in Lara's mansion. Search around, solve the right puzzles, collect bits of her equipment, and use that equipment to solve another puzzle. And you know what? I actually have fun in this place! If you recall back in my PlayStation Tomb Raider reviews, I stated that I didn't see the appeal in searching around Lara's home because there wasn't really that much to do, and I didn't really find anything major. Legend has vastly improved upon this, and it's nice to know that there's something else for you to do if you were disappointed by the length of the main game. But with all that in mind, I do have a few minor complaints about the game. Firstly, the game is really, really short, around 5 or 6 hours at most, depending on your skill. And this concerns me, because especially with games like Tomb Raider 3 and Last Revelation, the other games were seriously lengthy. Even Angel of Darkness managed to get quite a bit of meat out of it, however unfortunate that may be. But my point is that you'll kinda wish that the adventure didn't end so soon. The combat can also be a bit easy. Not ridiculously easy, just plain easy. The enemies don't take that many hits and really don't try that hard to shoot you. Sadly, the same can also be said about some of the boss fights. One or two of them may provide a decent challenge, but for the most part they don't take that much of a beating. Now don't get me wrong, these are some pretty entertaining boss fights, just not quite tough enough. Basically, I would recommend playing this game on the hard difficulty if you don't want to wipe the floor with the enemies. Also, and this isn't necessarily a bad thing for me, but it may be for others, the game is also a lot more linear than the previous installments. But if you've never been a huge fan of exploration games, then I consider checking Legend out, because it's still a pretty solid game even without the somewhat free world aspect. Personally, I don't mind what form of linearity Tomb Raider games have, just as long as they don't pull off a Metroid Other M where you only go in a straight path throughout the entire thing. Geesh, that's the second time I brought that game up in these reviews. These motorcycle segments can also overstay their welcome a bit. It's really cool for the first few minutes, but it doesn't take you too long to realize that you're only occasionally driving left and right, and that all you really need to do to kill the enemies is just press the fire button and wait for them to die. That and the game can sometimes cheat with the collision detection, which gets annoying pretty quickly. I've also never been big on having to collect many little trinkets in order to unlock bonus content, especially if it's something as subsidiary as different outfits or object models. Can't I just have all of this as soon as I play the game, or at the very least after I beat it? Lastly, there are these things. Quick time events. Yes, this was sadly the first Tomb Raider games to use them, and unfortunately they carry on through to future games. Except for Underworld for some reason. They are ridiculously easy to pull off, and the game gives you quite a lot of time to get it right. So, in other words, they're almost worse than your regular quick time events. Continuing on with the story, after obtaining all the pieces of Excalibur, Lara returns to the Oblivion Stone Die from the beginning of the game, where Amanda and Rutland are there too. What's absolutely awesome is that you're able to use Excalibur, and my god is it powerful. This is probably one of the coolest weapons I've ever seen in a video game. It travels far and decimates anything in its path. It's kind of like a 3D version of that laser sword from The Legend of Zelda. This just kicks so much ass. While after disposing all the troops, Amanda emerges with a shadowy figure from Peru and tries to stop Lara. And the final boss is pathetically easy. Yeah, no use regenerating your health, good sir. I'm just gonna beat you down to the ground again anyway. So we finally put Excalibur to the stone, and it seems that if the die is activated, it will allow you to communicate with the past, as we see a vision of Lara's mother recreating the moment before her disappearance from the beginning of the game. This means that Lara has a chance to tell her not to take the sword out of the stone. But Amanda unfortunately comes in and encourages her to do so. So it seems that Amanda was the one who made Lara's mother vanish all of those years ago. And here's probably Lara Croft in her most absolute furious. Make sense right this second, or I swear I'll execute you where you stand. Where is my mother? Avalon! I'm wasting my breath. From this moment, your every breath is a gift from me. Damn, she's pissed. So as you may have gathered, Lara's mother is still alive in Avalon the mythical resting place of King Arthur, and where Excalibur was forged. Lara leaves Bolivia to search for her mother, and the game ends on a cliffhanger. Still better than the Angel of Darkness ending. Hot damn is this game an achievement. Crystal Dynamics has done a superb job of bringing back life to the Tomb Raider series, and it's coming back stronger than ever. This is a damn good game. 
The graphics are absolutely gorgeous, the music is well fitting, the gameplay is incredibly satisfying, and the story, while a little ridiculous, is definitely one of the more fleshed out ones in the series. Some of the environments probably won't make you think of Tomb Raider, but it's still by far more possible than Angel of Darkness. <laughs> wow, that's some great dancing, dude. If you like straightforward action-adventure games with a little bit of puzzle solving, I'd certainly recommend Tomb Raider Legend. Though I would suggest playing the other games first if you want the full appreciation for this one. I'll give it a 9.2 out of 10, standing for Halla Freaking Luya, some improvements. This goes right on the shelf, along with the other treasures, and it only gets better from here in Tomb Raider Anniversary. As the name would probably imply, this is an exact remake of the very first Tomb Raider. Crystal Dynamics is going to take this and turn it into something like this? How in God's name are they going to pull that off? Let's take a look. Well, firstly, the story is exactly the same as the original, so we can just dive right into the gameplay. Holy hell, this looks much better. Like Tomb Raider Legend, the controls have been massively improved, and there's also now the inclusion of the grappling hook to do more puzzles. Some of you might be happy to know that most of the areas are faithful to the original, but it should be said that some rooms and even whole levels have been removed from the main game. Which, to me, is a good thing. I honestly thought that the original Tomb Raider could seriously drag at times, and some of the levels felt like that they would never f***ing end. Thankfully, I can safely say that the length of Anniversary is much more bearable. Not too long like the original, and not too short like Tomb Raider Legend. The areas that have stayed in the game have been tweaked to suit the Legend engine, ugh, try saying that three times fast, and to overall create a much better experience. A new addition to Lara's moveset is the Adrenaline Dodge. Continuously shooting at the enemies will cause them to fill with rage and charge at you. Dodging at the correct moment will let Lara pull off a Matrix and perform a headshot when the time is right. The bosses have a similar feature, though for some reason the game decides to call it the Rage Meter. Because that's totally different. And speaking of the bosses, my god are they awesome. Not only do they look far more threatening than they did before, but strategies have also been given to these bosses by having you figure out the best way to defeat them, and it is insanely gratifying when you do so. No longer do you just have to stand there and blast away with your guns. Now there's a lot more skill involved. The battle against the T-Rex was amazing. To this day, it's one of my favorite boss battles of all time. There's a hell of a lot more music in this game and it all fits appropriately and creates a wonderful atmosphere. As mentioned before, the graphics are excellent and the voice acting is better than ever. Even with Natla. Although I gotta ask as to how Crystal Dynamics came up with the design for Natla after seeing this. And to show how different Anniversary is to the original, here's the final five of Natla in the PlayStation game. And here's the fight in Anniversary. This game is just so damn fun! No amount of words can describe the sense of accomplishment I feel after beating a level, and especially after finishing the game. This is one of the very few games that actually make me smile out of achieving something, and it's an absolute pleasure to say that I own this game. This is in fact my favorite Tomb Raider game of all time, and it deserves every bit of praise it gets. The only thing I don't like about it is that the damn quick time events return and it's worse than ever. Remember near the end of the game where you had to get your weapons back and kill Natalus henchman? Well that all does make a return as one big quick time event. Bullsh**! Why would you do that? That was one of the few satisfying moments I had with the original game. And you go out of your way and take that out of the remake? That's ridiculous! Oh, and you'll never guess as to how the henchmen are defeated. Idiots. Also, wasn't there a cowboy dude with them? What happened to him? Did they just forget to make a character model or did they just simply run out of time? But yeah, aside from the disappointing fights with the human enemies as well as regular enemies having inconsistent intelligence in times, I'd highly recommend playing this game. If you're just getting into the Tomb Raider series, this is without a doubt the one to start off with. It brings back the more open-ended style but still keeps the areas confined and easy to keep track of, and for that I applaud it. Tomb Raider Anniversary deserves a whopping 9.6 out of 10, standing for happy, joyous rating. It's really shy of a perfect score, but the fact that I'm giving the Tomb Raider game this high of a score should be saying a lot. It most definitely deserves to be on one of the top shelves, along with the other treasures. Let's now move on to the final game in the Crystal Dynamics trilogy, Tomb Raider Underworld. This is a direct sequel to Tomb Raider Legend, and surprisingly almost has the exact same story premise. 
Except instead of looking for Excalibur to activate a stone die, you're looking for Thor's hammer in order to get inside Avalon and find Lara's mother. In addition, Amanda also managed to find Natla after the events of the original game and anniversary and kept her inside a concealed bubble. Tell me if this isn't a recipe for disaster. I mean, come on, even Lara very late in the game knows that Natla's gonna be trouble, and she even sends out another doppelganger with skin to burn Lara's house and try to turn her friends against her. And this doppelganger eventually shoots and kills Alistair, so why bother keeping Natla alive aside from having another plot point? Eh, but more on that later. Gameplay-wise, well, first of all, the graphics are spectacular, and it's definitely the best-looking game of the trilogy, but there isn't as much music as the other games. Well, at least the stuff that is there sounds quite nice, but it's not exactly something I can hum along to. The controls are basically the same as Legends and Anniversaries, but thankfully returning from the PlayStation games is the ability to sprint. Again, I think every game should have this feature. Combat has also been tweaked a bit. Lara can now shoot at two targets at a time, and the adrenaline dodge now consists of you having to manually perform the headshot. Unfortunately though, shooting at enemies with one gun on each hand needs more time to kill them. I try to focus on one target as hard as I can, but I cannot for the life of me figure out how to avoid aiming at two enemies. The acrobatics don't really help that much either, because you barely move an inch away from your enemies. The only new combat mechanic I found somewhat useful was being able to perform melee attacks, which I generally use if I get stuck to aiming at two enemies. But aside from that, now showing the enemy's health, oh man, combat, what have they done to you? It's not anywhere near as bad as Angel of Darkness, but Crystal Dynamics, if something's not broken, don't fix it, alright? What you had in Legend and Anniversary was just fine, why did you feel the need to change it? The tone once again has been darkened, but fortunately not to the extent of Angel of Darkness, and Lara is definitely still more likable. Although one particular bit concerns me at the beginning of the game. Lara dies below the ocean and comes across a tomb known as Niflheim, an underworld based on Norse mythology. It is here that we find Thor's gauntlets allowing us to hold a hammer. Guarding them though is a giant kraken that does not in any shape or form attack you, but Lara still decides to not only kill the poor thing, but in the most brutal way possible. Dude, it was just minding its own business. How do you know it couldn't have been welcoming or even quite friendly? Do you just assume that all Kraken are evil? Most of the areas are also just flat out depressing to look at. With the exception of Thailand and the burning of Lara's home, they all just have different shades of blue and gray, and it makes the overall adventure not anywhere near as heartwarming as Legends, and especially Anniversaries. In addition, the puzzles feel rather lazy compared to the other games. I can't quite put my finger on it as to why, but somehow they just don't give me the same satisfaction as they've done before. The motorcycle makes a return, but thankfully instead of riding on a straight path and occasionally shooting bad guys, you're able to control it at your own free will and use it to get to far places where you can solve puzzles. This is something I forgot to mention in Tomb Raider Legend, but once again you're allowed to throw sticky grenades on the enemies and watch them explode. These weren't included in Anniversary and it would have made a pretty cool addition to the original game, but I guess they weren't totally necessary. Finally, and this may not be an issue to some, but you know what I miss about the other games that's not present in Underworld? The boss fights. There isn't a single one. What the hell? Oh sure, you could probably count the Kraken as a boss as well as this troll looking dude in Valhalla. But as mentioned before, the Kraken doesn't attack you at all, so it's a puzzle boss more than anything, and the giant troll goes down pretty easily after throwing a few grenades, and even becomes a regular enemy near the end of the game. I mean, come on! One of the most memorable things about the Tomb Raider games were the boss fights. Take the T-Rex, for instance. It was completely unexpected, caught many, many gamers off guard, and for years has telefied the living hell out of them. Sure, it looks pretty damn goofy now, but think about the times, man. So after getting all the accessories to wield Thor's hammer and obtaining the hammer itself, we return to Natla who tells us that Lara's mother is in another underworld called Helheim, but also informs her that she needs to know the ritual of Odin to open the gates leading inside. As you'd suspect, Natla does know the ritual and Lara takes this opportunity to free her and let her help out. Okay, what outfit am I going to wear on my way to Helheim? Hmm, well I suspect there's going to be some water so I think I best put on the wetsuit. Oh, maybe that wasn't such a good choice. Uh, I guess I better go back and change it to something more pseudo- Okay, what? There's defying the laws of physics, and then there's just thinking I'm stupid. Anyway, when Lara enters Helheim, she sees Natla performing the ritual, which will allow her to use Thor's hammer to open the gates. While investigating further into it, we finally come across Lara's mother, who's in a pretty nasty state and now a servant of Helheim. Coming to this realization, Lara's forced to shoot her, and much later than the audience have already predicted, Natla reveals that this was all part of her evil plot to destroy humanity and that she killed Lara's father. What? We barely got to even know this woman in Tomb Raider 1, but because this game says so, she suddenly knows Richard Croft and was the one to kill him? That's just random and very much at the last minute. Did Crystal Dynamics just think this up on the fly as a way to make the game feel a worthy conclusion to a trilogy? Why would you even think that? 
Ruby hinted at any point that Richard and Natla used to work together? Doesn't matter, Natla killed Lara's dad. No questions asked, just go with it. So anyway, when Natla's just about to leave the room, the doppelganger returns to kill Lara, but is ultimately saved by Amanda. Alright, this is it. The big battle. It's odds against odds. We've met our match. It's time to confront our worst enemy, ourselves. This is the moment of truth. One shall stand, and one shall fight. Or Amanda just throws the doppelganger over the edge and is never seen again. Hey, what did you do that for? This could have made for a seriously epic fight and you ruin it. I want my boss battle, goddammit. So with the doppelganger out of the way and bashing our way through a horde of trolls, we can now confront Natla and stop her from using a doomsday device known as the Midgard Serpent. That if activated will cause a volcanic eruption consisting of the blue hazardous ooze down below. Like the quote unquote battle with the doppelganger, the fight against Natla isn't even a fight at all, it's just you going through a very confusing puzzle design while she tries to throw fireballs at you like in Tomb Raider 1. All in my wetsuit. If you eventually figure out where to go next, then after smashing the last switch, Natla will try and fix the machine again. Hmm, I should probably watch my back just in case Lara tries to stop me from repairing this machine. But I think I'll be okay, just as long as I- Oh, why didn't I see that coming? Natla falls into the ooze, Lara and Amanda escape using the conveniently placed die, and they're teleported back to the temple in Nepal where Lara's mother disappeared. Amanda no longer wants Lara dead, Lara gives her final farewells to her mother, and the game just... kinda ends. Well, that was... anticlimactic. Out of the entire Crystal Dynamics trilogy, this is definitely my least favorite. It is very much playable, and in a sense, it's still worth playing just to finish Legend's story. But in terms of the overall experience, compared to something as incredible as Tomb Raider Anniversary, I gotta say, I'm a little disappointed. A lot of the environments are bleak, the story feels unfinished, and honestly, the game can get pretty boring at times. The return of Natla also felt a bit forced to me. I guess it could have just been that they had to find some way of tying Anniversary to Underworld's story arc, but that's kind of the issue. Why do they bother placing Anniversary in the middle of a trilogy? It mostly acted as its own separate game, there was no need to. And god, I cannot get over the fact that Natla killed Richard Croft. Hell, Carell would have made a more convincing murderer for Lara's dad. Unless you don't particularly care about seeing the rest of Legend's story, truthfully, I would not recommend this game, especially as your first one in the series. There are some fun moments in the game, but the more tedious parts are just too difficult to ignore. With that said, I'll give the game a 7 out of 10, standing for a 50-50 chance of interesting things happening. I'd probably put this game in the treasure pile, but definitely on one of the bottom shelves. Sorry, Underworld fans. Only one more game left to go, guys, and it's the biggest and most acclaimed one yet. With Lara Croft back on her feet, how else will Crystal Dynamics improve the Tomb Raider series? Well, tune in next time as we look into Lara's latest adventure, Tomb Raider... <sighs> cannot for the life of me remember what the subtitle was. Oh. It's just Tomb Raider. Did I forget to mention that Tomb Raider Anniversary is the worst sold game in the series? What the hell is wrong with you people?